Okay, we're going to get started as people start rolling in. Um, thank you for joining us today on the centennial celebration of the women's right to vote. I'm Kirsten Solanowitz, as many of you know. I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new ones, which I'm excited about. I'm a director at large on the state board, and I also am the current vice president for the Wayne region, and I'm glad that you are all here to join us. Uh, I first want to say thank you very much to Tanya Grillo from Grillo Law, who is our sponsor for this event and is one of the reasons why this is possible. So let's give Tanya a round of virtual applause. Thank you very much, Tanya. I want to let everybody know that this is being recorded so that we can post it on our YouTube channel for everybody to watch for years and years to come, hopefully, so we don't forget this monumental occasion. Uh, so Keep that in mind as you have your videos on. Uh, the program today is going to be a 30 minute lecture followed by a 30 minute uh, time period for Q&A. And then uh, Rokia Draper, our president, is going to give us a toast um, in honor of today. If you have any questions, please feel free to place them in the chat uh, and we will get to those after the presentation. Uh, now, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Sarah Eggie is the Claude D. Pottinger Professor of History at Center College in Kentucky. She's the author of Women's Suffrage and Citizenship in the Midwest, 
1870 to 1920, which won the Benjamin F. Shambaugh Award for the best book in Iowa history and the Gita Choudhury Prize. Sorry, you can correct that pronunciation in a few minutes. Um, from the Western Association of Women Historians. Her research has been featured in the Smithsonian. She has been featured in documentaries on the women's suffrage movement, including Simple Justice, produced by South Dakota Public Broadcasting, and Commitment to a Cause, produced by Iowa Public Broadcasting, and numerous podcasts and radio interviews. Her interest in women's suffrage developed after taking a women's history course at North Dakota State University. She learned that little scholarship existed in the women's suffrage movement in among rural women generally and in the Midwest specifically. And what scholarship was available argued that rural women had little interest in women's rights. As a child of generations of strong-minded farm women in the Midwest, she knew that this scholarship was strong. She continues to study the history of women's legal and political status, investigating the ways that gender has shaped claims to citizenship through the naturalization process. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah so that she can start the presentation. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kirsten, and thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, I am delighted to be with you all on this momentous day. Um, just so we all know exactly what we're celebrating today, 100 years ago, the um, 19th Amendment was certified by the Secretary of State, a man named Bainbridge Colby. And um, we often think of dates in history and their importance. And there are a couple of different dates in the history of women's suffrage. Um, you may have seen posts on social media on August 18th. That was the day that Tennessee became uh, the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. So that was the threshold for ratification of the amendment. But the official certification, in other words, all amendments need to be officially certified, that took place today. Um, and apparently, um, Secretary of State Colby did this at 8 a.m. in his home with little fanfare, and that was it. Women finally had, after almost 70 decades plus of agitating for the right to vote, women finally in the United States could cast ballots. Um, it's not to say that women never voted before 1920. We know that many women in many different places did, but there was no national provision that uh, allowed all women to vote. And the 19th Amendment created that. Um, one of the things that I'll say right off the bat, the other reason why this is really important, in a legal sense, there is very little before the 19th Amendment that explicitly stated that there would not be discrimination based on sex. So in other words, the 19th Amendment explicitly says that you cannot deny the right to vote based on or on the basis of sex. Um, there was very little language before that, this point, um, legal precedent and Supreme Court cases, um, state court cases, and then even in the Constitution, there's nothing that says that there should be no discrimination on the basis of sex. So the 19th Amendment, in terms of a, sort of a legal framework, is tremendously important um, for establishing this idea or the notion and the precedent that will be continued and perpetuated later that um, women should be treated equally uh, above, and in terms of the law. So this is a, a momentous occasion. Uh, in some ways, when I talk to my students about this, I say, you know, 100 years that women have had the right to vote. This is outstanding. And then I say, only 100 years? That's, that's it? Um, the United States has been a country for much longer than the 19th Amendment has been around. And so for a lot of the women in particular, this was a long time coming. So I'm just excited to be here to talk about this topic with you all. Um, I'm going to start with an overview of this, the kind of broad outlines of the movement, the national movement, and talk about a couple of major key issues. I'll talk about some of the key figures uh, and, and use them to talk about these issues. And then I'm going to talk about the Midwest as a region. That is where my area of expertise is when it comes to women's suffrage. And then I'll talk about a specific state. I like to talk about a case study, I think it gives us some specifics that we can really dig our teeth into. And so I'm gonna talk about South Dakota. As Kirsten said, I am from South Dakota um, and my research focuses on three states, Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota. 
And I find the story of South Dakota really fascinating. And so I'm delighted to share that with you today. So um, to begin, when we think about the women's suffrage movement, we often look to the, the 19th Amendment as the culmination of the national movement that was really encapsulated by the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA. And that's in part true. It really was the national body that organized uh, efficiently and throughout the country uh, for the right to vote for women. Um, and, and it does, I think it's important for us to recognize what these women were doing. Um, but it's certainly not inclusive of all women. And that's something I'll talk about more in depth. Um, but I'll just say right off the bat, um, the point of the movement at the national level was not necessarily to get the right to vote for all women. That was the idea, that was the messaging, but the actual practice of the, what they, these women were doing was not necessarily to enfranchise all women. We know that African-American, Native American, immigrant women, especially Chinese, and women who were married to foreign-born men were disenfranchised at the time and continued to be in various um, circumstances and cases. And so um, the 19th Amendment we should celebrate, as I said, as a, legal mo as a moment in legal history that's transformative, but it's also not necessarily a beacon of full equality for all. So um, this movement that we see the culmination of it in NASA actually began in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, and it's closely associated with the abolition movement. Um, abolition was, um, it took a variety of forms, but the idea was that they wanted to abolish uh, the practice of slavery for all enslaved people. And so these ideas then uh, percolated into these notions that women were having about themselves and their own status. And they recognized that as they were talking about um, the lack of rights that enslaved people had, they could see themselves in having these conversations about the lack of rights that, that they themselves also had as women. So I'm going to share my screen now uh, so I can uh, talk with you about, see if I can get here and here. Now, can everyone see, oh, can everyone see the full slide or yes? It's, I hope it's showing the full slide. I have a presenter view in mind, so I'm not sure if you all can see the, I hope you just see the full slide. Okay, so um, when we think about um, the national movement, then we often think about the key leaders. Um, and so if you all can see uh, here, we have Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I'll briefly talk about Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She was primarily the writer of the group of NASA. Um, she cuts her teeth as an abolitionist and she's at some of these early meetings that women start to have where they start to identify themselves as unequal in terms of the law. Um, she doesn't necessarily do a whole lot of uh, active campaigning outside her home. She has a very large family, but she really provides a lot of the um, intellectual and rhetorical messaging that suffragists will use. Um, alongside her was a counterpart, Susan B. Anthony. Now, Susan B. Anthony is a fascinating figure. Um, she also began as an abolitionist and grew in prominence. Um, she is a dynam dynamic speaker, and she will also um, really wield power in terms of captivating audiences and bringing more and more women to the fold. Now, Stanton and Anthony are working primarily in the 19th century, and eventually they will pass the baton of NASA to Carrie Chapman Catt. Um, and Carrie Chapman Catt is kind of our, our way into talking about the Midwest because Catt, unlike Stanton and Anthony, who were from uh, the Northeast uh, and kind of New England area, Carrie Chapman Catt is from the Midwest. She's from Wisconsin originally. And at age seven, she moved to Iowa and grew up in Iowa. And Catt is a f also a fascinating figure. Um, she uh, moved somewhat as a young child, uh, young person. Um, she graduated. She's a college graduate from Iowa State Agricultural College. That's what it was called at the time. And uh, Kat was sort of a go-getter, uh, even at a young age. Uh, she formed a drill team, um, not like a drill team that dances, like a, uh, like a military drill team where they had, they used broom handles that served as weapons and they would uh, practice their drills. Um, she was captain of the debate team at Iowa State Agricultural College. 
And so she will later serve as a superintendent. Um, she has two marriages and both of her husbands pass away, unfortunately, after just a few years of being married with her. And so she'll spend the rest of her life really devoted to the suffrage cause. Her first national campaign is in South Dakota in 1890. She is a national organizer under the direction of Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony is really her mentor. Um, and so when we think about the connections that the Midwest has to the national story, one of the things that I note is that it's the Midwest where these women really test out their strategies and figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, and in part, um, the Midwest is really important because it's so difficult. They, they almost face insurmountable odds. Um, there's physical or practical limitations to running campaigns in the Midwest. Um, this was a region, it was the, the latest to be developed by white settlement. Certainly there were people who lived in this place in the Midwest uh, region before white settlers came. But primarily white settlement moved into this place after the Civil War, during and after the Civil War. And so there was really a lack of infrastructure. It made conducting any political campaign extremely difficult. So Carrie Chapman Catt actually figures out how to run political campaigns in South Dakota under the direction of Susan B. Anthony in 1890. And then there'll be other campaigns. South Dakota actually had seven amendment campaigns which is something we don't think about. We don't think of South Dakota as a hotbed of suffrage activism, but in fact it was. It was one of the states that had the most suffrage campaigns, amendment campaigns for women in the state to get the right to vote. So one of the other reasons that I start with these, these women and get sort of give an overview here is when we think about the national movement, if we end with them, if we just sort of say, here, here are these women, we obviously miss all the women of color who are also involved with NASA. Um, but who were largely excluded or, or pushed to the margins. Um, there are famous examples, the 1913 uh, suffrage parade in Washington, DC, and how black suffragists fought to uh, walk and march in the parade and, and did so, but only after um, forcing the white advocates to uh, put them in the parade. Um, there's lots of cases of exclusion. Um, and so certainly that's part of the story here. Um, and if we, again, if we don't, if we sort of celebrate these women, we miss this complexity. The other thing that if we sort of don't talk about, uh, if we sort of end with these women and we don't talk about in particular the Midwest, we miss another interesting component of exclusion and that is the exclusion of immigrants. Um, immigrants were prominent in the Midwest for a few reasons. Um, and so what ends up happening is NASA develops um, a, an interest in the Midwest, but also a, a distaste of the Midwest. Um, not only because they have to campaign there and it's, it's quite difficult because there's a lack of infrastructure and uh, it's really just practically troublesome, but because increasingly the immigrants that move to this place are opposed to suffrage, at least that's what these women think. And so they sort of write off the Midwest as a backwards, ignorant region full of people who are uneducated, who uh, lack refinement and who will be diametrically, categorically opposed to women's suffrage until forever. They are, they are unmovable. Now, I wanna point out, I, I mentioned African-American suffragists and, and really sort of race broadly. Um, I also uh, wanna point out that the same language that white suffragists are using against African-Americans in the South, why African-American men uh, we don't want to really allow them to, to vote. And so allowing white women in the South to vote would actually be helpful because it would either cancel out those votes or it would perpetuate white supremacy in the, in the South. Well, in the Midwest, they're using similar language about uh, un, not being educated, being ignorant, being backwards. Uh, they're using that same language and they're targeting immigrants. Now, who are the immigrants that they're tar targeting? I'm gonna put up the next image here. This is the, these are the states that according to the US Census Bureau that have some or all of, of their part, part of the state boundaries in the Midwest. Um, it's a pretty large region, as you can see, um, pretty extensive. And if you can picture this region having at the time, in the 19th century, about two, maybe three railroads, depending on the, the time frame, this is very vast and very difficult to travel through. 
Uh, but these immigrants are coming into the, the, this region after the Civil War in particular, and they're gaining a foothold, in part because it's so, so vast, they can really establish ethnic enclaves. Now, primarily, the number one group of immigrants coming into the Midwest are Germans. Um, they by far um, have the largest population in this region. Um, the second largest group is actually a, a made up of a number of different national identities. So, and those are Scandinavians. They would include Norwegians and Swedes, uh, Danish people, Finnish people, lots of different groups from that northern, kind of northern European uh, group of countries. But the Germans, um, out they're, they're the largest population, even larger than all those Scandinavian people combined. So they're settling in these ethnic enclaves. They're, they've got a lot of um, clout, uh, and they are really perpetuating these identities against what the white American-born settlers who are also moving into this region are, are saying. They, they don't like the fact that, for example, these uh, immigrants are sending their kids to parochial schools that are run by the, the church. So if you have a large group of Norwegians, they're gonna send their kids to a Norwegian Lutheran school. And those kids are going to speak Norwegian and they're going to celebrate Norwegian holidays. And they're not necessarily going to pay much attention to what's going on in terms of becoming American or learning about American democracy. And this is an increasingly a, a problem over time um, I'll just give you a little foreshadowing hint. If you're thinking about what's coming next in the early 20th century, we will see uh, the rise of nativism and eventually that will culminate during World War I as nativism against primarily Germans, but really broadly in the Midwest against any immigrant who was not American enough. So we already can see that this pot, we are stirring it slowly. Uh, I do want to point out that over the course of the 19th century and into the early years of the 20th century, the first couple of years, whatever tensions existed, the immigrants coming in from these Northern and Western European nations were, were rather uh, tempered. They, they really weren't that big of a deal, uh, in part because this area, it's so large, it's so vast. The idea that we, we just need people, we need laborers, we need farmers, we need inhabitants. So a lot of immigrants were welcomed. They were openly excited. They were excited to have these immigrants come in. Um, many of these immigrants, um, alcohol consumption is a big part of their cultural values. If you think about German beer halls or uh, other groups, they really uh, had a lot of alcohol consumption as, as a hallmark of their ethnic identities. And uh, this becomes a problem because temperance especially among white American born settlers becomes the number one issue in the Midwest in the late 19th century. So we already start to see lines of tension. We start to see some fragmentation uh, emerging along this idea of whether or not it's okay to drink alcohol. And I wanna point out it's not just alcohol consumption. Drunkenness was a sign of weakness. Uh, and the idea was that sobriety was of utmost importance in a democracy. So you can see these tensions actually go deeply into the ideas, the very notions of who is a good citizen. Those who are sober are, are good citizens who understand what it takes to be a good citizen. Other people are not. And so the final point I will raise before I start telling you more about South Dakota is this case study. Um, in a number of these states, um, including Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan, and, and Wisconsin, they all had a legal provision in their state constitutions called alien suffrage. Sometimes it's called declarant suffrage. What this allowed for was that immigrants, foreign-born individuals coming to these states could take the right to vote, would have the right to vote, after taking out what was called the Declaration of Intention. This was the first step in a three-part naturalization process, and it was taken out after two years. So the naturalization process took five years at this time, roughly on average, and at the end of that naturalization process, it would go to court, they would petition to become a citizen, and they would take their oath, and then at that point, in theory, they were supposed to get the right to vote. But alien suffrage allowed for the right to vote to be bestowed before that five-year process was finished in year two. So this is the, 
big point of tension that emerges and really erupts in the 20th century, especially for suffragists who become increasingly frustrated in this region that they do not have the right to vote and they are citizens with birthright citizenship, while these non-citizen immigrants do have the right to vote. So this dichotomy just percolates over time. And by World War I, the idea that Germany, that Germans are the enemy, they're not just the enemy abroad, they're the enemy at home, that they are perhaps uh, planning some acts of domestic terrorism, that they are plotting electoral sabotage with their votes, that they're going to overthrow democracy. And look at them, they're these drunken Germans and, and they're out and they don't take seriously American democracy anyway. We've seen how they've treated it over the years. They don't care. I'm, I'm elaborating here to sort of give you the sense of, of how these fears and how these sentiments were stoked over time. So when the United States did join the war in 1917, in the spring of 1917, a lot of these ideas about loyalty and being a good citizen were really cemented in the Midwest. And this is the fulcrum on which women in the Midwest will then get the right to vote. So I'm gonna explain how this worked in South Dakota. So here's a map of South Dakota, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. Um, as it, again, just like uh, the region as a whole, South Dakota is, is quite large. Um, at this time, just to give you a sense, there are two main railroads for the most part. One that came up through the sort of so southeast corner there where Union, Clay, and Yankton counties are, and it moved upward uh, following, which you can kind of tell that's the Missouri River, up into Pierre and then uh, up over into North Dakota, what became North Dakota. There's also another uh, railroad at the time that went across southern Minnesota and connected through Minnehaha County where Sioux Falls is and then also went across the state all the way over to the western part of South Dakota. So campaigning was very difficult for a long time in South Dakota. People would take the train, but it didn't get them to very many places. You can see all the places that were missed uh, at this time. So campaigns in the 19th century were pretty difficult. Um, there were a lot of piecemeal efforts. And unfortunately for the suffragists, there was a lack of success. It didn't help as well that the suffragists were, most of them were uh, advocates of temperance that didn't win them votes, especially among immigrant constituencies who had the right to vote and were also interested in drinking. So then in 1910, we have the arrival of a new state leader, a woman named Mamie Pyle. Her name was Mary, but people called her Mamie. And Mamie Pyle was different than the previous activist. She was not a temperance supporter. She really took seriously organizational efforts. She took a page from Carrie Chapman Catt, who had been trained by Susan B. Anthony. And she really organized the state in ways that uh, allowed for more contact with suffragists and started to really convince voters that they should support women's suffrage. Um, here you can see an example of this. Um, the Golden Car Tour um, occurred during the 1916 campaign. Um, after 1910, there were, there were three campaigns, one in 1910, one in 1914, and one in 1916 before the final campaign, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the automobile becomes one way that women can bridge those gaps or those divides between people who live in rural areas. They can even reach out to those immigrants living in those enclaves and talk to them and see if they're interested in or would potentially change their minds about being opposed to the, the cause. This is monumental. I can't stress enough the ways in which having face-to-face -face contact was really meaningful. It's a point that I want to make clear that even though we think about the lack of inclusivity and the arguments that these women will make, that above all, they were tenacious. They wanted the right to vote. They were, they, they just, that was their singular goal. And to get that right to vote meant that they were going to do whatever it took, including driving their cars across the middle of nowhere to try and convince voters to support amendments. They also gave a lot of um, literature to voters. This is just one example of many, many pamphlets and flyers and other pieces of ephemera that you can find in archives across the Midwest. 
literature was by far the the way that women women suffragists got the message out to voters potential voters um, and you can see this uh, comes from the last campaign in south dakota lots of different rationales provided that for why women should have the right to vote many of them steeped in a idea of progressive moralism um, progressive not as we think of progressivism today or, or, or being a progressive progressivism was nonpartisan um, at the time both political parties definitely took it into uh, adva advantage of it and were interested in it um, but it really means uh, removing corruption um, and however you want to, you would you'd be interested in doing that, whether it's economic corruption, uh, reducing monopolies and the power of monopolies, maybe it's political corruption, um, where you would remove um, the power of um, privilege and the power of um, nepotism, and maybe you want to uh, institute more organization in city governments, that would be a place for you to, to see that. So all this is to say that these women are working doggedly they are expending tons of resources and time to get the right to vote but unfortunately it's not happening uh, in south dakota by 19 the end of 1916 yet another defeat the sixth amendment campaign ended in defeat and now suffragists are faced with yet another uh, potential amendment campaign um, that will be unfolding but this is where things start to change. So in the spring of 1917, the suffragists contact the uh, pro-suffrage legislatures in the uh, state legislature, and they submit yet another bill that will put before voters an amendment to enfranchise women. This all seems pretty normal. And then the United States joins the World War I, and the governor, a progressive Republican governor, a man named Peter Norbeck, uh, has an emergency legislative session to pass some emergency war measures. And he takes the woman's suffrage amendment where it says the right to vote shall not be abridged on the basis of sex. And he adds a clause and we will disenfranchise anyone who is not a naturalized citizen and has the right to vote. So this effectively ended that legal provision of alien suffrage. So now what we have is a whole new context where the question is not necessarily should women have the right to vote or in other words, do we believe women are equal. Now this amendment is asking who is a good loyal citizen. Women have start to prove themselves both in terms of their progressive aims of removing corruption um, and sort of uh, trying to bring about new changes in American society at this time, um, but they also proved themselves in terms of mobilizing for war. And you can see that on the, the quote, this comes from the citizen Republican from a very small town in South Dakota called Scotland. Um, you can just see this quote, it just gives you a, a kind of a picture of how they're building their case. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to sort of summarize and, and the clear point that this raises is that these women start to argue that they're not only fighting corruption or graft or enemies such as dirt and disease, those were progressive ideals of removing these um, unsanitary conditions at the time. We get the food, Pure Food and Drug Act out of the progressive era, for example, and women are largely backers of that. So they're, they're linking their activism and the right to vote to that. But then they're also saying we're anxious and continue to do our bit for the war effort. In other words, we're fighting enemies abroad and at home. We're fighting disease and dirt, um, like physical unsanitary conditions, but we're also fighting those diseased and dirty immigrants who are not doing their part to mobilize for the war effort. And what they really are saying are Germans. This in fact couples with what you see across newspapers in South Dakota and really the Midwest. This is just one example of the thousands of pieces of propaganda and newspaper articles that perpetuate this notion that Germans are going to use their ballots or use their influence to lie, to cheat, and to commit electoral sabotage. So this context then inflames nativist sentiment and it makes the entire question about citizenship. And you can see it in, this is probably the most famous piece of propaganda from the 1918 campaign in South Dakota. Um, amendment E was the amendment, that's the, that was the name of it. 
Americanism and suffrage. Again, the question is about who is a good, loyal American citizen. And you can see uh, the word woman does not appear on this piece of propaganda. This does come from the South Dakota Universal Franchise League and Mamie Pyle herself, who did actually admit in a letter, she never said this in public, but she said, I really hope the war doesn't end too soon because otherwise our whole propaganda, our whole argument would, would, not, make any, would not make sense. Um, she got her wish. The election was on November 8th, 1918, and the war ended on November 11th, three days later. So in the end, women in South Dakota got the right to vote in 1918. The Amendment E was successful. 64% of South Dakotans voted in favor. The other campaigns, the closest margin of victory, the, the absolute no highest number of people voting in favor was about 39%. So you can see just the dramatic increase in uh, favorability for this uh, amendment. Um, and again, it, it's sort of a question of were they voting in favor because they wanted women to have the right to vote or were they voting in favor because they wanted to disenfranchise people who are not naturalized who had the right to vote. Um, and it's hard to make that out, but I think that there's a, a bit of both in that answer. So when we look back at this campaign, it adds another layer to the narratives that we tell about women's suffrage. In many ways, it reaffirms that women were tenacious. Women wanted the right to vote. They were genuine in their campaigning and in their efforts to demand the ballot. But it also affirms that the way they did it was not necessarily always inclusive of all. And in this case, women were willing to use nativist sentiment against Germans, anti-immigrant rhetoric, to claim that these, again, falsely, that these immigrants were somehow going to imperil democracy or commit electoral sabotage, and they could use that to their advantage um, to win the right to vote. Um, uh, South Dakota will become the 15th state to give, to, to ratify the 19th Amendment. They will do so in a winter special session in uh, December 1919. Um, and then women in South Dakota will celebrate alongside all women in the country when the 19th Amendment passes and is certified as it was today, 100 years ago. But I do think it, it allows us to revisit and reconsider and, and think about the way that these movements unfold and ultimately what's at stake. Um, when we think about the right to vote and the power that that has, how we assign that power and who we consider uh, a citizen who should wield that power, I think is an ongoing conversation. One that I'm delighted to have with you as we continue this talk. So I just wanna say thank you all uh, for having me and I will open it up for questions at this point. I will stop sharing my screen. There we go so that I can see you all. Okay. And I'll turn it over to Kristen and anyone else who has questions. Does anybody have a question? I don't see any in the chat, um, but I'm happy to bring, to unmute anybody that would like to ask one. Just let me know. I can't see everybody's face, so. Okay, Becca, I see you have one. Hi, thank you so much for um, all that information. I never knew about the South Dakota and the um, immigrant population. That's really fascinating, nothing I ever learned. My question, um, and we've seen through like, I think the civil rights movement, um, if something's a law, it doesn't actually mean that it's gonna be followed in real life. And so I'm curious um, if in your studies with the ratification of the 19th Amendment, what maybe obstacles are put in place specifically to keep women from voting? Yeah, so um, in the Midwest in particular, what I have uh, looked at is that often what would happen is um, it would seem like a good thing at first. Um, so for example, women would say, we want the right to vote. And then 
um, the state legislature would say, well, here, we'll give you the right to vote in school bond elect uh, elections. So those would be elections not for all school issues, just for issues where they were attempting to raise money to build a school. And the women would say, oh, okay, yeah, that's great. Like, that's a great first step. And then the state legislature would say, okay, so we've given you the right to vote on this issue, now you're done. <laughs> so in some ways it's that sort of um, acknowledgement that uh, we wanna sort of keep you from agitating by um, appeasing you, but not, but not, we're not gonna do anything else. Um, it wasn't necessarily in the Midwest a specific um, denial um, sort of like the Civil Rights Act um, of 1964 and then the Voting Rights Act of 1965 were ex explicitly uh, getting rid of the Jim Crow laws that were in place across the country. Um, it's, we see in the Midwest it's a little more nuanced. I will say though that one of the things that was a big problem was occurred in this period between 1907 and 1922. Um, the Congress passed a law called the Expatriation Act of 1907. And basically this is a big act, but it, one of the provisions says that women derive their citizenship status from their husbands. So if you married a foreign born man and you are a birthright holding citizenship woman, you lost your citizenship. Yeah. So. Then what happens when the 19th Amendment is passed, or in the case of South Dakota, when we get the right to vote in 1918 as a state, they don't have the right to vote um, because they've lost their citizenship because they're married to a foreign-born man and the foreign-born man does not have citizenship. Even though this woman may have been born in the United States, she's not a citizen. So I think this is a kind of a, a random thing, but if you watch Downton Abbey, does anybody watch that movie or that show? The, the, well, the mom, the, the, she's married to this Lord, right? Or I, I, it's been a long time since I watched it, but she just, she's an American by birth, but she lost her citizenship status when she married an English Lord. So she, not only does she not have the right to vote and she doesn't live in the United States, but she's actually stateless because she cannot be a citizen of, uh, of England at that point. And so she, it's a fascinating moment from 19, 07 to 1922, where there would be women who would not be able to vote. Um, and so that's a big issue uh, that we can see when we think about how people were denied the right to vote. Um, it will be remedied with the Cable Act, which was passed in 1922. And that was a, an act that was taken up while the women's suffrage campaigns were going on. And then a lot of these suffrage leaders will create what you may have heard of as the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters, that's one of the very first issues they'll take up, is that they want to remedy this issue of women who've married foreigners, foreign-born individuals who can't vote. So they will get that passed in 1922. Okay, it looks like Tanya Lundberg has her hand raised. Thank you. I'm uh, still new to managing Zoom meetings. I've attended hundreds of hours of them at this point. In fact, six hours today. But uh, anyways, Tanya, go right ahead, ask your question. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was really great. I just want everyone to know that today the 19th Amendment stamps came out, if you can see these. Um, they came out at the post office and they expect them to sell out. I don't know how long they're actually going to, I don't know if they're going to keep producing them or if there's just one batch, but I bought five sheets because I want them for as long as I can have them. Um, and they're forever stamps. Um, and then kind of following up on Becca's question, Sarah, I think like you kind of touched on it a little bit with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. So we know that in the South, for example, they have poll taxes and literacy tests and things like that to try to keep former slaves, former enslaved people from voting, but was there anything like that specifically geared towards women, like no kids allowed at the polls or, you know, you, you have to be accompanied by a man or anything like that? Did they, were there any concerted efforts to actually stop us from voting once we were legally allowed to vote? Not, not for, um, in the Midwest, not for white women. Um, there were efforts in terms of like locally people who were maybe election officials who were opposed to women not being able to vote they would have um, hours that were not sufficient for women to be able to leave their homes leave their children and go vote 
Um, so they would have maybe that you could only vote during, during the day or during the morning or something. And that would be obviously very difficult if you've got little kids and you're, you don't work outside the home. A lot of women at this time didn't drive on their own. Some did, but a lot didn't. And so it was these kind of informal things. It wouldn't be to the extent of like a poll tax or a literacy test where you had to physically do something, but we can see this, we can sort of think about it. If you make it difficult for people to go to the polls, they're much less likely to go. And we do see that where um, in the Midwest and even for, even for uh, it's mostly rural women, and again, these would be largely immigrant women, they, it would be much more difficult for them to vote. Uh, we do know that women's turnout was pretty low in the 1920s in rural Midwestern counties. Overall, it, it picks up, but it sort of lags. Um, rural Midwestern, rural women in general, uh, it takes them a while to really get to the polls. It's not really until the late 1920s, 1930s, really as we see more uh, advances in the automobile that women can get access to the polls. Um, and women will continue, the League of Women Voters will continue to do both educational programs for women to train them about here's how you vote, here are what you're voting for, the different positions. And then they'll also advocate for increased access for women to the polls, to voting. Um, they'll be one of the groups, for example, that will really push for absentee ballots um, or just other ways. You don't have to necessarily go to the polls, right? So there, there are, again, examples. I think it's not the sort of um, the literacy test where it's like you either do this or you don't. It's more of a subtle uh, method that, that is employed. Um, I will, I do want to mention also for Native American women, um, many of whom lived in the Midwest, but they're of course across the country. They are not, Native American um, individuals as a, a communities are not considered citizens until 1924. Um, but then it's also complicated because for some individuals, um, if you became a US citizen, you had to renounce your tribal affiliation in your, in your tribal de-identity. And for a lot of people, they did not want to do that. That was an untenable and it was an impossible choice. So that further disenfranchised um, Native women, Indigenous women who were living in these communities, but faced that difficult choice of wanting to perhaps vote and become a citizen, but also, again, it's that it sort of, it's subtle, but it's very clear what you would be giving up to do that. So we don't see high um, numbers of, of Native Indigenous women voting um, both uh, before 1924 for sure, but then even after it, it takes a, a while. Yeah. Perfect. Laura, it looks like you have a question. I'm going to unmute you. Yeah, this was great. I was particularly interested to hear about, I think, the unfortunate connection with the immigrants. Um, which, you know, it, everything's complicated. It's good to know how complicated it is. Um, but I always like trying to um, get takeaways or, or make comparisons about significant events in history. You also mentioned Downton Abbey, which made me think of Mrs. America, um, which is a show on Hulu, for those of you that haven't seen it, about the ratification of the ERA. And so then I'm trying to think about parallels between that process and the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And then I was also thinking about, um, you know, just sort of the push to get more women in um, political office today and, um, and how we can support other women in that and what maybe some of um, the, the, the best strategies um, that you, you saw in your research from the 19th Amendment that we might be able to apply today or maybe even some of the best um, arguments against it that, that we might be facing in trying to um, put forth similar goals as an organization or as individuals? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that first came to mind was what I saw in the Midwest often, in part because the settlement and the infrastructure development went hand in hand with the rise of the women's suffrage movement. It, it sort of grew. So a lot of the women created the spaces they created the institutions, they were on the front lines of that, and they used that community recognition to demand the ballot. So in the Midwest, I don't see a lot of women, at least publicly saying, I believe I am equal to a man, 
they probably did think that, but they're not going to publicly say that. Instead, what they did at the time was they created that community clout, that, that sort of public acclaim, and they it made this argument that sort of was like, if you deny us the right to vote, you are denying the integral role that we've had in our communities and the development there. So in other words, what, I'm, what I think they did so well in that particular moment was that they, they created these connections, these sort of relationships, and they said, this is what this power has given us. This is what we have been able to do. And you've benefited from it. Our communities have benefited from it. Our nation has benefited from it. And they're able to link it to broader ideas uh, that are cherished ideals in the United States. I, I, so I think in some ways, if we think about the ERA, that takes what the 19th Amendment says a step further, right? Because the 19th Amendment is just de not denying the right to vote, but the ERA is really saying, we're not going to have any discrimination on the basis of sex, right? We're going to have full equality. So in some ways, I would think that um, if we took a page or if we sort of thought about what this could instruct us to do is, how do we link that those ideas and what that bent, what that would gain not just for women but for our communities for our our families for our nation what does it really mean when we say that we cherish this democracy and the governing bodies that we are are, are that are representing us um, how can we then sort of showcase what that does broadly um, because frankly, I think that people don't necessarily um, on face value say, yes, women should be equal. I will support this. I mean, Phyllis Schlafly was brilliant because she was able to poke holes and reveal what people actually might really truly hold. Um, and the other part of this that as I keep talking, I think about is uh, women's suffrage at the time was incredibly radical. I think we've lost some of that because we just, oh yes, women going to vote, like, okay. That seems totally normal because it is to us, because for most of us, it's something that we've seen or, or understood, but it was incredibly controversial. The fact that it passed in Tennessee, the, the, the story of the representative and his mother, and she wrote him this note saying, you better support this because this is what your mom wants you to do. I mean, literally coming down to one vote, I think we think of that it is a dramatic story, but it also shows how razor thin how just how close this was it's I think important to say yes enough people supported it but a lot of people did not support it and and the way that it passed through these state legislatures ratifying the amendment it was not a a cause that had popular support in other words so if we want to generate that kind of popular support how do you make those connections how do you de-radicalize something that's incredible that people some people think is incredibly radical um, I do think that frankly when you think about the women's position um, as I look around and I see all of you and and just admire um, I was reading your website of all the things the advocacy that you all do you know the fact is we there's still fighting that we need to do there's still inequality whether it's equal pay for equal work whether it's parental care um, you can see my daughter's unicorn on my whiteboard behind me, perhaps. Um, she started kindergarten today, and we have virtual learning, and it was lovely, but it's the reminder that, you know, I, 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 we don't have childcare now. We don't have her the, outside of, of us. She's here with me now. So it's these kind of layers of really how are we going to hold ourselves? What do we really want to see? And how can I link the fact that um, childcare, or maternity leave or equal pay benefits everyone, not just women, of course it benefits women, but how does it benefit people broadly? Um, because it does, we know it does. So. You're making me tear up. <laughs> no, most of us all know I just had a baby. So that, uh, that hit home for me. Uh, looks like we've got one more question by our immediate past president, Alina Clark. Uh, so we'll take her question and then I'll um, introduce Rokia for our toast. Thank you so much everybody that put this together and Sarah you did an awesome job. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think a lot of times of the suffrage movement, um, the women of color get kind of left out of it. 
and I know that they played a very integral part. What part did they play in the Midwest? That's a great question. Um, so in the rural areas, the way in which people identified, um, they're often ethnic identities, um, they are racialized. So in the late 19th century, we do see German or Italian or Irish immigrants racialized in a sort of racial hierarchy. Um, and those are again, rural areas. Um, other people of color though were instrumental. Um, so one of the cities that has gotten a lot of scholarship, which is wonderful, is Chicago. Detroit also has, speaking to you all in Michigan, uh, a lot of scholarship on um, African-American um, federated women's clubs. These were called, um, it was the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, it's the official moniker from the time. These women were dynamic. They were just these electrifying presences. Now they were often excluded from NASA, and so they were not necessarily engaging in the same ways. However, they were doing the same things that uh, the national leaders that get a lot of attention were doing. Um, they are having holding petition drives. They are organizing marches. They are um, going out and reaching out to their neighbors and, and talking with them during campaigns. Um, a lot of what they do as well is kind of speaks to what I was just talking about is they were often making the case that the right to vote would benefit the black community. And they were doing that in ways that a lot of these white suffragists could, couldn't, they just couldn't put that together or, and articulate it in the more powerful ways that the black suffragists were. So they would talk about how racial inequality was this massive problem. The Jim Crow South is not just the South, it's Jim Crow nation. Um, we have these kinds of provisions all across the country. And so they're arguing that we can better the status of all people of color, all African American communities by giving the women the right to vote because they would vote for issues like better schools for their children, um, better resources for their communities. Um, they, were, they were also very much on the front lines of incarceration at this point. We know um, incarceration rates were incredibly high for African Americans, they continue to be. And so that was a, a way that they again could position themselves and in this sort of integral web of activism and make, a, a, I find, a really compelling case, um, often a case that, again, white suffragists may have missed. They were maybe saying, women need the right to vote because they're equal. And that's not quite what African-American women are saying. Yes, we think we're equal, but we also are incredibly, we find um, the vote will um, benefit our communities in really profound ways. So um, in Chicago, these women are extremely active. Um, they're working alongside immigrants uh, because there are a lot of immigrants had moved to this place as well at this at this time. And so you really see um, a lot more um, integrated efforts that, uh, among people of color broadly that you don't necessarily see white activists taking. To be fair, white activists uh, later on, are they, they try to be. In particular, they focus on working women's, so women who worked for wages at this time. There was a growing number of women working in factories, and a lot of these women were immigrant or um, impoverished women um, or women of color. So there were small efforts, but I, I, they, were, they did not match the efforts by any means of African-American women to c connect to their, as they called them, their sisters broadly. So I think that's a really powerful part of the story as well. Well, Sarah, I think I can speak on behalf of everybody in thanking you for joining us to celebrate this momentous occasion. I, uh, I learned something that I didn't know before, and I'm sure we all did. Uh, I don't know that I mentioned before, but a, a lot, large portion of us were able to go to DC back in November and see a bunch of the women lawyers, or not the women lawyers, but the right to vote exhibits um, that they had. So some of it was, um, brand new for me though, especially with the Midwest information that you provided. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I wanna introduce now our president, Rokia Draper. She is going to lead us in a toast to honor the day. Rokia. You got muted? Yep, go oh, ahead. Awesome, hello everyone. Um, wow, thank you Sarah Eggy, really for sharing your knowledge and time with us today. We truly appreciate it. Um, the, I just wanna say a little bit, if I may, the right to vote for women is a victory for celebration. But as we know, it didn't come without its own struggles and sacrifices. 
um, of the women that fought before us, giving up their families, social reputations, work, and at times their life to guarantee us the right to participate in one of the most fundamental rights in our uh, democracy. Uh, the expansion of the voting rights to women has been essential to our fight for equality, whether it be in the workplace, in the classroom, in cultural norms, or even running for political office. Um, as we heard, while we have the right to vote and that is cause for celebration, we also know the fight for equality for women is not over. So I, um, I want to leave you with this. We've made important gains, but these gains are a first step and certainly not the last step. Um, particularly the right to vote for women in this year's election is important for a number of reasons. Um, and we have, um, in the midst of this election, an unprecedented selection of Senator uh, uh, Kamala Harris, the first woman of color as a vice presidential candidate on a major party ticket for president uh, is a promising step in the right direction. So with that being said, um, I'd like to propose a toast for the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the legal right to vote for women. Um, with that, I'm going to try to see if I can. I've uh, clicked the unmute all people. So if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to do so. Awesome. So with Got that it. being said, here's to uh, celebration for the 100th anniversary of the right for uh, women to vote. And here's to our generation leaving behind a legacy that'll protect the right for all. Cheers. 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 That was good, Rokia. Thank you. That was awesome. Sarah, that was very informative it was yes. it was fantastic thank you so much mm -hmm. for your time today I, we really do appreciate it you are a wealth of knowledge and i wish i could share you with as many uh women who who would listen i find i find the last comment and last conversation even more um fascinating as an organization uh we have had conversation about diversity and inclusion um and historically that is something that I, I think um, all women could unite on. And however, for whatever reason, and for all the political reasons that happened, and uh, we're not there yet, but hopefully this generation can fix that, just like Rokia said. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Now, Kirsten, we all need to see your shirt. Yes, oh, yeah. sure. All right, I'm turning the recording off because this does not need to be broadcast across YouTube. <laughs>